Metres, no? <laughs> and uh, he will speak about how mathematicians S thanks a lot for the introduction, as well, thanks a lot for the Institute of Mathematics and the French Embassy. Uh, I strongly apologize not speaking in Spanish, but uh, I think uh, my English is enough poor that so you can understand it. Okay? So, uh, I will do like just a few minutes about big data, since I'm the first one, just to precise the stuff. And then after I will give you two examples with introduction to some possible extension of the work that I will show you. So if we look at Wikipedia, we see that the big data is a very strange definition. Basically, it says that it's a new data set with new processing, so it's more or less what we are doing all the time. And so if we look on big data, there were many applications where data were already big as uh, image processing or signal or things like that. But mainly there were new applications such as genomics where people were overwhelmed by data. So that's why there were computer science troubles, there were uh, biological problems, expertise problems. So that's why mainly big data is concerned with new application of the data, especially because we have many sources of data such as uh, social, uh, website or internet or image or everything, so we are overwhelmed by all this data, which introduce new questions and new way. So why we are overwhelmed? Mainly because they were like a dig digital storage explosion, so we can store the data in quite easy way, even if it's not clear if we can analyze the data. So the main, I think, main things that we can give as mathematicians is what can we do for all these kind of data and of course, I won't present everything, just few applications, but we have to be clear that this digital storage is mainly a regression in terms of uh, analysis of the data. If we look at Berkeley School of Information, which is quite a good school in a very good university, and they ask many people what is big data, the only thing they can give about asking so many people is a word cloud where even the word, data, the word data is not present, okay? And we don't have, we, we don't know, uh, we have no legend, we don't know what is the size, we don't know anything about these things. So we, we see all these kind of uh, visualization which are very nice from an art point of view, but have absolutely no meaning in terms of information. So, mainly, we can say that big data need big theory, and I think we have a place to, 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 to be here. And in fact, it was already mentioned by Turkey in the 70s, in 70s, so where it said like uh, price of calculation is decreasing even if the price of theorem is still the same. So economics says that uh, we have to fight, okay? But we have a place to, to, to be here, especially because we have so many data and so we don't know so much to do. So there is many applications. You will see some after some application in social science. I will do two applications in uh, biostatistics. One will be more epidemiologics and one will be more ecology. Of course, if you have any question or if you do not understand what I'm saying, do not hesitate to interrupt me. Sorry? Yes? Yeah, in, he made in, in, in topology and he did a lot about data visualization as well, explaining that it's the first thing to, to, to synthesize the information. But he had a very large spectrum of, uh, of, of, uh, of mathematics. You are perfectly right. So let's see the first application about drug cells data for outbreak detection. Uh, that's France, and that's uh, incidence level of flu. 
which is quite common for the moment. And uh, flu is about a few thousand people dying every year in France. I'm sorry, I don't know in Mexico, but it's a quite uh, important uh, issue. So if we think about ep epidemiological surveillance, it has the three main uh, int, uh, aim, objective, which are to describe, to evaluate, and to alert. And why we want to alert, to plan, to implement, to communicate, to say to the people to go for vaccination and so on. And so for the moment, it's a network. Uh, so in the US, it's called CDC. In France, it's called Sentinel. But you have physicians who report, who have, uh, in, a, in a network, we have around 1,300 physicians. And uh, at the first, it was done with Minitel, uh, all stuff. And so they report the things. And you have like a threshold. If after two weeks, you have exceedance of a, a given threshold, you declare that you have, uh, you have an epidemic. And if you have an epidemic, you have a lot of processing for uh, public health. So how do we do? We have to compute the incidence for every week, which means the number of cases reported by the physician, except that the physician do not report all the time. So mainly what we consider is that flu is seen as a Poisson process, where every people are with flu or without flu. You can do with many other uh, diseases, but in fact, since the physician cannot report all the diseases, you have a very narrow uh, window of possible disease followed by this kind of network, okay? So some diseases are removed out, some diseases are removed in, but mainly what you will do, you will consider that the cases are reported, and you see that as a Poisson process, and so the incidence is mainly the intensity of this process multiplied by the number of cases reported, adjusted by the fact that not all the physicians report the case. And after, when you have this Poisson process, you have to see what's happened if you are not in an epidemic way. So there is a kind of uh, periodic regression, surfing regression. You look at the history of the data and you give like uh, a, a non-disease, non-epidemic disease level. And if your incidence level is greater than a given threshold, you declare that you have an epidemic. So I try to do like a list of all possible uh, no, of a part of the possible techniques to do the reference value. So mainly, all the techniques based on data can be used to define a reference level of epidemic, which means like a normal level of epidemic. Uh, most of them are generally, are generally implemented, and uh, there is still new ones which are proposed regularly. But what you want to do is like a compromise between sensitivity and sensibility. Basically, you want to fight very early against epidemic, and you don't want to miss epidemic. And you don't want to declare false epidemic when there are not, because there is a price for that. Okay? We had a lot of discussion about H1N1 in France, because they want to vaccinate the people, and they were not so hard as it was declared at first. So if you declare false epidemic, you will have some trouble with the public uh, adoption of vaccination. So what is a true epidemic? In fact, here, that's, I would say, the definition given by law. What is an epidemic? So there is a lot of work, I think, in Mexico, like in every country, about these kind of things. And in 2008, 2009, there were like a revolution in this article of nature. So the two first people are working with Google and the others are going, working with CDC. And they say that basically they found that uh, Google search was a good indicator of uh, flu trends. So maybe you know, like you have the query in blue and you have uh, CDC in, uh, in orange. And if you look, you have uh, uh, something like uh, two weeks in, in head. Two weeks is uh, terrible. It's, a very, it's, it's incredibly useful. Two weeks is something like, in, if you look at the US, a couple of 10,000 people not dying. So it's a huge, huge progress. So everybody, wow, wow. We all look at that and say, that was like a, a revolution in public health. Unfortunately, like many tricks, 
It was a spurious prediction. Okay, so there is a, 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 also an article in Science in 2014 showing that in uh, on 100 prediction, almost on, on 108 prediction, you have 100 prediction which are false. So in fact, if you want to predict, I would say like something like a, around 1,000 points with 50 million feature, probably you go on, on, on the wall. There is many, many reasons, and I do not have time here to, to explain it, but you have to keep in mind that uh, that was a revolution. Google opened a site for Google flu, they closed it. Okay? So big data, big theory, big trouble. Okay? Uh, we speak about big data for recommendation for books and so on. At least for me, I don't care about the books that you will read next week, the movies that you will see or you will buy this evening. But I think predicting cancer, predicting flu, epidemic is really, really more important. But Google is a nostrum that even if they do this kind of failure, there is no problem to continue after. Okay? So, in fact, even if it's a failure, there is some lesson we can take about it, that if you look at first, we have like here, basically flu prediction in every country is done by physicians. So you look at the physician and you ask them to report uh, the case of epidemic, which can be flu or can be some, something different, and it's not the same, but it's done by physician. If you look on Google, one thing which is important that we can have non-medical data that can give information about medicines. Okay? So even if it was wrong. So we tried to look on pharmacy data. We have about 20,000 pharmacies in France. And most of the pharmacies are connected to company. In fact, there is two companies. I won't explain all that. Such that all the tickets are recorded. And so, based on that, so we, we work with a company where there are about one on seven pharmacies, and they do, and we have the daily sales, and we have the age of patients for prescribed product, and we have that about uh, eight years. So the question was, can we do these things with pharmacies data to predict the level like epidemic? So pharmacies data are not medical data because you have the prescribed data, which are more or less medical data, but you have what's called OTC, over-the-counter, non-prescribed uh, uh, product that you can buy without going to see the, the, uh, a doctor. So you can do for prevention, you can do because you cough and you don't want to see the doctor, so you want to buy some medicine, or someone offers you because they're fed up that you cough, or you think you will cough also if your neighbor is coughing, or whatever you want. But so it's not medical data, but it has some meaning in a medical point of view. So I won't present all the stuff, but you can see here that's for uh, gastroenteritis. So gastroenteritis is more complicated than flu because flu is always in, uh, around Christmas. Gastroenteritis you have in winter, but we are also in summer. And so if you look, the case of gastroenteritis are here, okay, over the few last years. If you look at the prescribed drugs, you are more or less on the same way, but if you look at non-prescribed drugs, you are ahead compared with the, with, 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 uh, the case of gastroenteritis. So what you can expect is that if you look at the prescribed drugs, you, will, you won't see before the doctor because you have to go to see the doctor, but you will be more precise than with physician where we can do only at the national level you can do at a more regional level. Here you can do at a regional level. But if you look non-prescribed drugs, you can see that you can go ahead. And if you do some regression work, you can see that uh, you have like a normal level. You, feel you, you fit a, a threshold to de declare an epidemic. And if we do that, we have more than two weeks ahead the French network, which is also quite a lot, epidemic. Moreover, you can do also that with uh, diseases which are not followed by physicians. So you can do with many, with many, with many, with many diseases. So just to some comments, uh, definition of drugs 
compared here was done with, uh, with, with, with a specialist. Confidence level was not, uh, I'm not addressing, thresholding extreme value, and so on. So there is many open questions that I won't do here, such as merging information, sampling, data quality, missing data. How do we put a confidence interval on this thing? I don't have to speak about that, but it's a very open question. There is many things to do. How can we uh, use, I would say, proxy information to define public health? There is many issues apart epidemic definition as well. Okay? So it's a very open uh, subject with many statistical questions. And so if you're interested, we can discuss about it. That's a joint work with Mathilde Pivel. We had some presentation with him. So the second one uh, I will present you is a um, special cluster within, uh, so here it's uh, French Guiana forest. So a little bit south. So special statistics is always, begin always the same. That's uh, it's called the first law of geography, that if the things are close, they are more likely to be the same. Okay? So what you want to say is that, in fact, if you look in most uh, statistical books, it calls like uh, let x1, xn, iid data. So independence, you can remove this, uh, uh, you have to remove this, uh, these things if you work with special data. And in fact, there is another way like uh, um, temporal data have the same thing, except in temporal data, you have an order before and after. In special data, you don't have an order of your dependency. Okay? So you have your point, you have your data, they are dependent, and you can't put an order in these dependencies. So what do we do? Like we, we, are, we are interested in, in forests. So the idea on forest is that you have the tree, and you will say that one tree is equal to one point. So you will change this image to this image. Okay? So here is uh, 250 meters square in French Guiana. Every point is a tree. And in fact, you, have, you can put a mark on the tree. So remember, what is random in a, in a point process is that the position of the point which is random. Okay? So you don't, you, for example, there is many applications apart that you can think of mining, you can think of uh, uh, astrophysics, you can think about uh, the health in the forest or whatever you want. But so that's a, uh, a map which represents as a point process uh, of, um, a part of Amazonia. The size here is 250 meters. No, uh, so the size of each circle, thanks, that's a good question, is related called the dBH, which is more or less the diameter of the tree. Okay? So we look at the diameter at 1 meter 30. Why? Because it's the easiest place to do it. Okay? Diameter breast high. It's cool. And so here in this one, you see that the, a, a large circle means, uh, uh, a, large circle means a, a, a big tree. Okay, so we have no, in, in, in South America, there is no big tree, as in Africa, but there is quite big trees as well. You can see, for example, that sometimes you have two trees together. So it can be because the tree is not round, but it can be also because you have contour on the tree, which means it's not so round, and so you can have a tree with it. Okay, you can have some mistake like here and so on. So precision of the data, especially when you are near the equator, is, is, is quite difficult because your GPS is not working well. So just like uh, an example, so we, uh, 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 a question. So we want to study the forest for many reasons, because you want to use for harvesting, so to get the resource, or you can use for tourism. For example, in many forests, if you look in North America, in, in the US, the main revenue of a forest is tourism. So the local people coming and thing. So you can have many reasons for that. You can have for conserving the biodiversity or so on. And what you want here is to monitor the evolution of the forest. And one of the questions an area wants to know is how it's uh, spread over the forest for each, um, for each variety of trees. 
So here is an example. Uh, Dicorinia is the most harvested uh, species in uh, French Guiana. And so here is uh, in one plot. And we would like to know where are the cluster. So cluster is defined as a high concentration of points. That's a general definition, which means absolutely nothing. From a mathematical point of view, is it like a first order characteristic, like a, you want that the intensity of your point process is higher? Is it a second order uh, characteristic, such that the distances between the points is small? And of course, if you work on the mean or on the variance, you won't get the same things. So things that you can do, okay, that uh, we did, and I will show you and show you the open question. So you have here the thing. You take a point here, and you connect the nearest point. So if you do that, the nearest point is here, the one is here, and the nearest point not uh, included in your, in your path. Okay? So if you do that, you get all the points. Okay? So what is the idea? The idea, if you are within a cluster, the distances between the points will be smaller than if you are outside of the cluster. So by doing this, what you do, you transform a two-dimensional problem to a one-dimensional question. So you, you, you win one dimension. The other thing is also that you get an order within your point. So there were people, people like the Matei and his co-author, what they did, they used this ID to, to, to show like a regression on the expectation of the, of the distances with the Poisson process. So you have to think that at each step of your path, you remove one point. So if you remove one point, your intensity decreases. And if your intensity decreases, your expected distance increases. So you can take that into account and do like segmentation in order to find where are the cluster. What you get is something which is very sensitive to the starting point, and as well for the regression. So what we did, we did this transformation, and we compute the probability of clustering for each consecutive point in order to detect the cluster. So on what I will present you here, we assume an homogeneous Poisson process because it's easier to present, but it's not necessary, and I will show you. So what you have in an homogeneous Poisson process is that if you take a point and you take a ball around the point, your probability to find a point within a ball is just given by the surface of your ball, okay? And the fact is that it's homogeneous means that you can do the same thing everywhere. So you can get the distance to the nearest point as given as a Poisson process based on one minus the exponential of something which is related to the intensity of the Poisson process and the surface of your ball. For people who are used to Poisson process, we have the probability of empty space, which means the probability of having a ball without point when you throw it through your, through your window. So what we do, we do in an iterative way. You say the probability of having a point, so if I begin here, the closest is the red one. So the first point is the gray area. And as soon as you have the gray area, you know the intensity that you can estimate here. You have the probability of having these distances between these two points. Then you can continue for the second point. It can't be in the black area, so you compute the red, gray area, and you continue uh, in a sequential way. So what you get if you do that, you transform your distances in probability, and of course, you have to, we have sensitivity to the first point, so you, we can do all the trajectory depending on all the first point, and so you get, in fact, from your end point, your end distance end point, you get do n pass. This n pass gives distances that you can transfer to probability. Then for, from that, you can transform your trajectory to dissimilarities and combine your trajectories such that you take the minimum to go from one point to the other point. And this gives you, you can show that it gives you a partition of your data such that you can do clustering. So if you do that, we get the statistics, you can transform your points to distances with clustering and define your cluster. So here, if we do that, we cut here and we get this three cluster, which is not so bad because you have also this data which are uh, like uh, outliers, not outliers, but sparse. 
it's easy, since we're looking for the one minus the exponential of the ball around the point, we can extend it with an integral on the intensity of the point to what's happened to inhomogeneous case in order to see if we have unexpected number of points in a non-homogeneous uh, Poisson process. So if we do that, in fact, we see, for example, in this example, that this uh, cluster, which correspond to here you have a low level, so if we look the slope, in fact, these two cluster, three cluster, uh, split up because the altitude and the slope, uh, in fact, indicates that this these uh, clusters are not the same. And in fact, you, find, you can find that there are genetic differences among these clusters. So just as a comment, distribution of number of clusters is unknown, okay, except for graphical way. The computational issue is quite important. We can't expect to extend it to many species, to extreme, to sampling. There are also many things. So ecology, especially if you include the genetic part is also a source of question, of statistical question, with practical implication, which are quite strong. Uh, we do not have so much time, so I do the overview quite fast, and I will, that's a joint work with uh, Nicolas Picard and Mathieu Emily. And just to close, thanks for your attention and your question, and so I try to keep few questions to finish. Thank you.